A superstar of the beat age prepares to meet his public. David Bowie spends two hours before a show caressing his body with paint. Bowie is a skinny lad with a pasty complexion and ochre dyed hair in a teddy boy style of 20 years ago. Yet with a dash of makeup, he's transforming himself into an object that is worshipped by millions of girls. Outside the winter gardens of Bournemouth, some of those fans are arriving to pay homage to a man who's become the high priest of pop. Every seat was sold months ago. Some fans were even blessed with a glimpse of the master as he scurried into the theatre. Oh no, what is this? What are you so upset about? I said he was coming around the back. I've been waiting for ages to see him. <laughs> Why are you so upset? He's smashing. I kissed him. I kissed his hand. I kissed his hand. I kissed his hand. I kissed him. I went, oh, oh, oh it's lovely. I've been waiting to see him for ages. He's fantastic. Don't worry. I kissed his hand. He's got thin little legs. I know. I know. Not only the young have come to ogle at Bowie, so have members of a pensioners club from Newcastle. It's as good as a show to us. We've never seen anything like this before. Haven't you? No. no. Meanwhile, the object of so much interest is trying on his kinky boots. His personal wardrobe mistresses attend the star before he graces the stage. This no. is the face the public wants. An ex-art student from Brixton, whose dad worked for Dr. Bernardo's Holmes, has turned himself into a bizarre, self-constructed freak. Impromptu, isn't it? <laughs> it is a sign of our times that a man with a painted face and carefully adjusted lipstick should inspire adoration from an audience of girls aged between 14 and 20. Six months ago, Bowie was unknown to the general public. Today, this 26-year-old man earns about half a million pounds a year. He can afford a personal makeup artist to coat his nails in silver. said that Bowie will soon be the world's number one beat singer. If he achieves such eminence, he'll be the first superstar of pop to wear shorty dresses on stage. Although he's married with a son called Zoe Bowie, he publicly admits to enjoying the intimate company of men as well as women which hardly deters adolescent women from swooning beneath his feet. And his records are selling in their millions all over the world. Watch that man! Oh, watch that! What would it mean to you to be able to go through that door? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know where he's going. I really would. He's just another fellow, you know? Well, I mean, it's different. Not, nobody like him can produce the music, you know? Isn't it a bit degrading standing outside person. the door no. while he's inside? Well, no. That's no, no, for him. No. Why? Well, it's degrading for me standing outside here. Why? Why? You go in there. Oh, 
Don't you find... I mean, why do you stand for it? What do you think? They're still there in the morning, locked out in the cold, yet prepared to suffer anything for a chance to see or touch him. Oh, he's lovely, yeah, I touched him. He's all warm and lovely. What they don't realise is that behind the freakish image, the Bowie Circus, right down to the flashy car, is a well-oiled show business machine. On the surface, the circus seems bizarre. Yet his backing group are professional musicians, the Yorkshire lads with down-to-earth accents, whose appearance merely seems to be moulded to fit into the Bowie image. The coach carries a team of 30. Electricians, road managers, sound engineers, stagehands who put up 15,000 pounds worth of equipment to project the superstar on stage. Oh, it's all right. <coughs> Later, he selects a satin psychedelic leotard and then he's off to the bedlam once more. He's also been smart enough to realise that in showbiz, the more outrageous you are, the more people will notice you. Because most of the reasons that I do what I do is because I, like, I just like startling people. Stop. Yeah, something to do. <laughs> England has a marvellous habit of being able to dissipate everything um, through this marvellous media. And um, long hair quickly got dissipated. I mean, I, I, I used to be able to stop traffic quite easily by just walking down the street, you know, no more than that, just because like, I had long hair. I'm, I'm a real trooper, you know. Uh, this is my life, really, you know, writing or performing. I don't, there's not much else I want. It's the biggest kick I, I know. I know all the drugs and, you know, you get a different kind of buzz off those, but stage is just something else. It's um, partaking of people. I, I, I'm very much a character when I go on stage, I feel. I mean, I... I like an actor? Yeah, I believe in my part, all the way down the line, right the way down. But it, I do play it for all it's worth, because that's the way I do my stage thing. That's, that's part of what Bowie's supposedly all about. I'm, a, I'm a, an actor. when the Beatles and Stones created scenes like this, the young saw them and world. Bowie's appeal lies in rebellion too, only he must be more outrageous, for public tastes have changed. When he dresses up and plasters his face, the kids of today see it as his way of flaunting convention, and they respect him for it. It's worth wondering, though, what the beat age will spawn next, when someone like David Bowie isn't even freakish enough to shock us anymore. I asked him on the show, what did David Bowie think about David Bowie? Um, well, all right. I find that I'm a, a person who um, can um, take on the guises of, of different people that I meet. I can switch accents in, in seconds of meeting somebody and I can adopt their accent. I've always found that I collect. I'm a collector. Um, and I've always just seemed to collect personalities, um, ideas. I have a hodgepodge philosophy, which really is very minimal. Um, very you little believe in God? In what? Do you believe in God? Um, I believe in an energy form, but I'm not, I, wouldn't, uh, put a, I wouldn't like to put a name to it. Do you indulge in any form of worship? Um, uh, life. I love life very much indeed. Mm. You split people down the middle, don't you, a lot? I, that is to say that people are, are hostile to you or they're, indi or they're totally indifferent. Oh, absolutely. To yeah. that. Um, mm -hmm. what, kind of, what kind of reaction do you get from the people who are, are violently in favour of you? I mean, do you get fan mail? Yes, a lot. 
What, uh, is it scabrous or dangerous or interesting or exciting? It's very sexy. <laughs> In what way? Um, well, uh, I seem to draw a lot of fantasies out of people. And a lot of the fan mail I get. A lot of it is awfully nice. I mean, they, they say, um, how's your baby and how's your wife and what's your mum's name and things like that. And a lot, but some of them are worth framing. Can you tell us about one or two of the framed ones? No, I couldn't really. No, they really are quite heavy. <laughs> <laughs> heavy duty letters, they are. Heavy duty. Heavy duty. Uh, du sorry, duty. So I drop me tea around. sometimes. Yeah. Carriages, that most exclusive of hotels in London's West End, at lunchtime today. Times are hard in the record industry, but EMI are celebrating. Against serious opposition, and for very serious money, they've just signed a real superstar. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr David Bowie. <laughs> Can I sit down here? No, I can't. I'll sit here then. Uh, about two days ago, EMI Records phoned me up in Australia and said, uh, would I like to take a 25-hour flight back? Uh, come and sit in a room with 75 journalists. Over the last year, I've made a couple of movies and I've completed an album and a single called Let's Dance. And tomorrow, tickets go on sale in the UK and in the next few days in the rest of Europe for concert performances in London. No other pop performer except perhaps Jagger could create quite this interest for the media of Europe or pull off the event with quite such style, particularly if they'd just flown in from Australia. David Bowie is here merely to announce his new album, the first in three years, and his first live shows for five years. He remains the most influential pop performer to have emerged in the 70s, and not yet put a foot wrong through constant changes of musical direction and a constant emphasis on style. The first tiny hints of that came when he made his first BBC television appearance 19 years ago in 1964. He was then still David Jones and founder of the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Long-Haired Men. Now exactly who's being cruel to you? Well, I think we're all fairly tolerant, but for the last two years we've had uh, comments like darling and uh, can I carry a handbag thrown at us I think it's just had to stop now as Bowie he took those ideas of fashion style and personal rebellion much further his music has ranged from rock to black American soul to more experimental electronic dance styles and his stage image has changed accordingly this was his creation Ziggy Stardust making his farewell in 1973 the new single, Let's Dance, shows Bowie changing again to New York black funk styles. It's his first release for EMI after 12 years with another record company, RCA, against whom Bowie now makes the remarkable accusation that they try to dictate his style. EMI don't give lavish receptions like this very often. They won't say how much they paid for Bowie, but rumours range from 10 million to 17 million pounds for a five-year contract. Reportedly so, yes. I'm, I'm overwhelmed that I've... Uh, <laughs> Is that anywhere near accurate? It's absolutely nowhere near accurate. Can you give us a more accurate figure? Of course not. <laughs> um, the reason that we um, uh, parted company, I think, RCA and myself, were that uh, we weren't really rec recognising each other's qualities um, to any endearing way, so... Uh, and uh, I had such a general burst of enthusiasm for me, am I, that I couldn't resist. <laughs> well, they really didn't like, RCA really didn't like your last year. Got to a point the where, and things like that. no, the, no, the, the, they really didn't like those albums at all. Um, in fact, one of the executives once suggested that he get me another apartment in Philadelphia so I can go back to writing Young Americans and stuff, which is just not a very sort of healthy atmosphere to write and record in. But yet, ironically, that's the sort of thing you've done with your first new record for EMI. Not yes. exactly Young Americans of Philadelphia sound, but a black yes. New York style. Yeah. Well, it's much better when nobody's actually telling me what to do. <laughs> what about the new album? And the, the single that's out already is yeah. very much more direct, much more rhythm and blues than yes. the, uh, the recent David Bowie yeah. output. Yeah. Um, I got to a st stage two years ago where I, f I found that the experimenting that I was doing was... Uh, 
eradicating a lot of the subject matter of my writing. But now I feel for the next few years I'll be concentrating uh, on a lot more basic, earthier kind of material. More emotional songs? Yes, I think so, for me anyway. Is that because of a change in your own outlook and personality? Uh, yeah, there's a gradual shift, I mean, when you reach mid-30s. Uh, I think that there's a period where you have to decide not to try and grasp frantically for the feelings of uh, desperation and anger that you have when you're in your mid-twenties, I think. And if you can relax into the idea that being mid-thirties is quite a ni nice place to be with a, an amount of experience behind you, you know, I think the perspective changes. How seriously do you take the business of writing pop songs? Uh, very. I mean, I always have. I still think it's one of the most direct and, and can be one of the most important of the art forms. Quite as important as... I mean, I'm sure it's, I guess, replaced painting in terms of defining one's uh, society or culture, quite definitely. He treated his press conference more like a cool actor than a cool pop star. Like Almost like some Put future Dirk Bogard in the making. Thank you very much and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. But then he has got two feature films opening in the next few months, including Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence, the first film in seven years from Japan's controversial director, Nagisa Oshima. In the past, your acting roles have very much been as an alien, an outsider in society. Are those the sort of roles you've particularly gone for or just...? Yes. Uh, I always look for uh, characters who have either an emotional or a physical limp. Um, I find that, uh, for me, not being a, um, I don't really see my future in, in acting to a greater extent than my involvement now. So I, I, I really like to have characters that I can at least play around with. Do you see the acting as more important than the music? I mean, how do you actually judge the performance of the two But they're sides? both very different. I mean, one is, up until Oshima, I don't know, my experience may change from now on, but up until Oshima, one is very much under the direction of somebody else's personality and uh, vision. Uh, whereas in my own music, of course, it's the reverse. Um, so I can't really equate them too much. <coughs> but with Oshima, I was given great freedom to interpret the role very much the way that I saw it. What about the future? Is it a question of simply picking and choosing different styles of music, different theatrical projects you want to go into, or anything completely immediate, different? Immediate, immediate ambition is to um, direct something uh, for myself. I've had uh, not a little experience with which is f what is fast becoming the new school of uh, filmmaking, learning, learn as you earn, I guess. The promo film, the rock promo, I puts its smack over in four minutes. Uh, but now I want to go into something a little more ambitious, maybe something around 30 minutes. <laughs> 25 minutes would do. Is it a question of still wanting to prove something for yourself, or uh, it's what's just, the motivation I mean, now? I, it's, uh, one can't fight the urge to play around with film, you know, and video, and, and sort of... It's a magic world when you, when you can create that little world and, and portray its environment and the characters in it. I mean, it's, uh, it becomes obsessive. From Brixton, isn't it? Okay. Just a couple, yeah. <laughs> just to, yeah. A couple of uh, back and some. Actually, I think I recognise a lot of people from Hatfield there. <laughs> I'm so. just thanks for uh, reminding me and, and coming out about the garden hose, the breathing through. Yes. The, I thought I was the only one. <laughs> How did you do? I did it like that. <laughs> That's a tough oh, one. Yeah. <laughs> I did, I'm disappointed. I was told he might appear wearing the little Richard jacket. <laughs> eh? Yes. Your great uh, hero, which now you've acquired. I've now acquired that through my wife. It was uh, one of our wedding anniversaries a few months ago. And uh, she, uh, my idol when I was a kid was little Richard. And she knew that, so she found one of his old original stage jackets, 1956, and she got it for me for an anniversary present. And the thing, little Richard, the guy is huge. <laughs> this guy, I'm, I'm, I can use it as a tent in the garden. I basically wear it on stage. I mean, he must have had like really little legs. And a big body. You know, and a big body, because yeah. the sleeves are down there on me. I saw him first in uh, 1963, I think it was, uh, 
and I think it might have been at the Brixton Odeon. I don't know, somebody remember the tour. Everybody remembers everything these days. And uh, the Rolling Stones were opening up for him. It's the first time I ever saw him. And they weren't really very well known. There's about six kids rushed to the front, you know. That was their fan base at the time. Everybody was there for Little Richard. And I think Bo Diddley was on the, on the show and all that. And it was priceless. I'd never seen anything so rebellious in my life. Some guy yells out, Get your hair cut! <laughs> and Mick says, and I'll never forget these words, Well, I look like you. <laughs> I thought, oh my God, this is the future of music. <laughs> but was and sure enough. <laughs> but, but was it music that, uh, that, uh, that engaged you, or was it the sort of showmanship of it all? It was really, it was, it was really the music uh, and the showmanship of it all. <laughs> it, was the two, the two. it was the combination, the I think. Again. I mean, I remember uh, my mother was really... Um, she didn't realise what she was starting, but she, she would always say at breakfast, oh, I could have been a singer, you know, and then she'd sing. And there was this thing on radio, two-way family favourites, I remember, on a Sunday, when I was about six. And every Sunday without fail, this thing by Ernest Luft was sung, and it was, oh, for the wings of That's a dove. That's like a boy soprano. That, he was a boy soprano. Oh, yeah, he's dead now, oh, isn't he? Yeah, he's dead. Yeah, uh, and he, he was, what, 90 when he died? His voice went before he died. Oh, is that what yeah, it is? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and my mother would say, Oh, for the wings, for the wings of a dove, far away, far away, and all this. And, I th and she was really good, and I thought, that's, you know, maybe, maybe, she, maybe she would be a singer. You know, she'd be a great singer. Yes. So that was like one of my first influences, I think, was uh, Ernest Luft. <laughs> but I mean, there, there you were, were in, in, in Brixton, and then in Bromley. And then in Bromley, yeah. And then in Bromley. I mean, uh, so and it's, it was just that one moment was it seeing Little Richard that decided you. Well, this is. It was seeing for me, Ernest Luft actually. Seeing I went Ernest along Luft to the church, that, and I saw yeah. him uh, yeah. singing along there, and I thought, oh, that's what. But there were there were weird notes in that, and there were other things on the radio that really uh, committed me to the idea of music because it was the pieces of music that didn't. They kind of broke my expectations. Was, I remember also on, in those days there was uh, Holst's Planet Suite got played a lot, especially Mars. Mm -hmm. And it's the do, do, do. And, and those notes were so <laughs> weird. They, they didn't follow anything that I knew, you know. And uh, songs like that and pieces of music where the notes didn't go the right way really got me, like Tubby the Tuba. Uh, you know, I do. Yeah, do, Sparky do, do, and the Magic do. No, that had a regular, oh, that was sorry. a kind of a... Sorry, I mentioned that. Right. No, 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 not <laughs> Sparky. No, no. Tubby the Tuba. Well, that, that, that one. Do, 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 it was like awkward, you know. Next one, I'm beginning to, to, to where you, you got to, into some sort of rock and roll. And yeah, well, I, but I like Little Richard along with this stuff. But you, know? but you mentioned that when you saw Little Richard, you mentioned an interesting word, rebellion. Yeah. I mean, what was the purpose of your rebellion? What was it? Oh, I don't think I really ever had a rebellion. Well, you, you no, no, no. <laughs> no only against, only against uh, my mother and father, really. It was really no wider than that. You, you know, it wasn't against the world generally. I wanted to get a lot of the world. I wanted as much as I could get. So, well, what, um, what, what was wrong with your mum and dad? They fuck you up, your mum and dad. That's, <laughs> that's what Larky said. <laughs> but do you believe that to be true? Um, w with my mother, yeah. <laughs> my dad was very... So, what they fuck you up, your mum and dad? Yeah. Um, they may not mean to, but they, they do. And... And they fill you full of faults they had. And they add some extra just for you. <laughs> the last verse is great. Though. What was the last verse? Do you remember? I don't it's know. man hands misery onto man. It deepens like a coastal shelf. So get out as soon as you can and don't have any kids yourself. <laughs> now that's, that's an English poem, isn't it? <laughs> so you didn't like your mum and dad or what they'd done to you? Wings of a dove. Oh, There's yeah. a funny note in that one, you see. Yeah. <laughs> Weird, isn't it? So, what I'm trying to get at now, yeah. I'm even more confused than when I first started, but... Oh, you I'm don't know, I confuse Mr. myself Hans sometimes. Mr. Hans is totally confused. No, he's not. No, no, I'm, no I'm don't let the suit fool you. Yeah, I don't let, I'm still That's going it. through Tubby the Tuba in my head. <laughs> <laughs> when 
does Ziggy Stardust come from? Oh Lord, I don't know. Was that the was that the, the, the that was the rebellion? Was it that was creating this kind of alter it was ego? Well, you know, the thing is, I never really wanted. I never thought that I could sing very well, and I I I, I used to kind of try on people's voices if they appealed to me when I was a kid, about fifteen, sixteen. I got into Anthony Newley like crazy because oh. a couple of things about him. One, before he came to the states and did the whole Las Vegas thing. He, he really did bizarre things over here. Now, television series he did called The Strange World of Gurney Slade, remember it. which was so odd and off the wall. And I thought, I like what this guy's doing, where he's going. It's really interesting. Mm. And, and so I started singing songs like him, but I was reading a lot of stuff like by the Angry Young Men generation, you know? And Keith, uh, who is it? Uh, was it Waterhouse? Keith Waterhouse. Yeah, what Keith Waterhouse called? and John the Osborne yeah. and uh, stuff like that. And so I was writing these really weird Tony Newley type songs, but the lyrics are about like lesbians in the army and cannibals and <laughs> pedophiles and, and things like that. It was this kind of, you know, I thought, yeah, this is my bag. This is, this is what my career is going to be like. Um, and the first album it really is the most extraordinary piece of work in that way. Yeah. I mean, utterly forgettable. But it's, <laughs> <laughs> But There's what no faulting its ambitions. But what about, about that sort of androgynous appeal that you developed? I mean, where did that come from? That sort of feminine side of you? Oh, that's just me camp being camp, really. But when did you first start being camp? Uh, when I put those clothes on, funnily enough. <laughs> 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 but that's Amazing what it does to you when, you when you drag up for the first time, isn't it, Tom? Uh, it <laughs> gave me a lucrative career, uh, for I a while, anyway. Was, no, I'll tell you what was even funnier, though, was uh, uh, getting my band to put the clothes on. Because my band were all from <laughs> Yorkshire. I've got to tell you, my father was from Yorkshire. From Tadcaster, my, wasn't it? Yeah, at, 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 well, somewhere between Tadcaster, Doncaster and York. So he's from there, and my mother's family were from Lancashire. So when I hear somebody, you know, I'm, I'm straight, I'm nearly there, you know, I want to be, buy a cup of some stuff to eat. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help it. It's, uh, so I'm trying desperately not to get into a well, it's, 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 it's really it's, hard. They do do it very well. It's, it's you sound excellent. like my dad, you see. It's, oh, it's really right. off-putting. I won't look at you. All right. Uh, <laughs> I will, actually, because he was a good man. Um, so these guys all came from Hull, you know, we're going to play a rock and roll band, the lot of songs and all that. And I said, yeah, yeah it's great. So, do you want to see what we're going to wear? Oh, yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> not wear. <laughs> not bloody right. right. I'm not putting that on. <laughs> I said, no, believe me, it'll, it'll, you'll look great. It'll, it'll really suit you. Yeah, right. And so I don't know how I did it, but I managed to talk them into doing it. And a couple of nights later, we'd done a couple of shows, and all these girls were all over them. And, they, and suddenly the dressing room procedure was really different. It's right. Who's got the blush? <laughs> it, hey, Trevor, have you finished with that mascara? <laughs> it was a phenomenal thing. Amazing. A little bit of eyeliner. Do you remember it fondly? I do. I, yes, absolutely. We had some wild times. It was a fantastic period. Um, we had no idea what we were doing. We really didn't know which way the whole thing was going. I just knew that I was getting bored very quickly. That's the, the, the great tragedy of it, in, in, I suppose, in my eye. Well, no, not really, because it was great to let go of it. But I tend to grasshopper about. My attention span is very short, as you can probably gather. <laughs> um, it, 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 um, there was a period after, we, we were only together for 18 months. The whole thing was over in 18 months, the whole Ziggy Stardust thing. Um, and a good halfway through, nine, ten months into it, I knew it was over already, and I, I just wanted to move somewhere else. There's a new kind of music. I wanted to write something, a different kind of theatricality I wanted to bring into it, and all that. And it was... Uh, uh, the last few months, I was really like treading water. I couldn't wait to finish. And you know, the amazing thing is that you nearly threw all that away, all that creative, creativity, through drugs, and you got through it in the end. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, it's uh, well. I guess all that period was pretty fine. You know, it was the later years, the later part of the seventies. But my story in terms of drugs and the um, alcohol and all that is no different to anybody else's, and it's almost. A textbook story. So. Except you survived it. Yeah. I mean, uh, well, a lot of us did, you know. I'm not the only one by any means. It, just just uh, tell me because it fascinated me in research. Right. So about you saw a guy on CNN, a doctor was talking about the effect that cocaine had on the human brain. I don't know if it changed your mind about drugs, but certainly had an effect of not making you not want to take drugs. Oh, I, that, that actually, yes, no, that didn't put me off at all, actually, when I saw that. <laughs> I, I know, I saw that in like, it was in the 70s, and I saw that and I said, whoa, too cool. I mean, it was like, it was just showing a brain of cocaine users and all the holes that were in it, the great huge holes. I thought, yeah, <laughs> that's me. 
it didn't occur to me that this was a bad thing. I mean, that didn't come for a, quite a while later. Really. And, and what, what, what started the change? What was it? Uh, I, you know, you, you can't have relationships with anybody. You don't know anybody else exists. I, it's just you become a really dreadful person, you know. And uh, uh, I just think I got fed up with being a dreadful person. That's really as simple as that. And, and uh, I guess I was lucky that I was able to knock it on the head, you know. Mm. And what about being a new father now? Because you've got a two-year-old child now, haven't you? Yeah, I do have indeed. A wonderful little girl, Alexandria. And uh, uh, also a wonderful boy, 31 years old. Yes, so... I've got so two. And I've got, a, I've got a, also a stepdaughter, of course, Zuleika, who's uh, 21. One imagines, of course, then, that uh, the 31-year-old, when that period of time when you, ha when you had the boy. Yeah. Um, that, in fact, you were kind of an absent father in many ways. I was. I mean, you know, I was on tour all the time. I was very ambitious. I was young. I was keen to go and, and, and um, do these stage things. Uh, and I was just uh, whizzing around the world half the time. You know? And now, of course, you've got time to sort of relive that, in fact. Recapture Absolutely. It. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I was very lucky in a way. I mean, the marriage, of course, went hopelessly wrong very early. But um, uh, Joe was with me since he was uh, five, six years old. So I was kind of a one-parent family since he was... That age. Are you are you a, a, a sort of new age father now? Are you, <laughs> are you a nappy changer? Come on, are you? Uh, no, I'm I, I'm ridiculously Victorian. I can't, I'm absolutely hopeless at, at that kind of thing. I've got a huge admiration for guys who can get in there like that. I just can't. I mean, well, I didn't. My wife didn't let me, which was great. <laughs> <laughs> she was like, "Oh, get hold of here," you know. And she was like pinning and wrapping things up, and you know, I knew there was some kind of. <laughs> Something in there was being prepared, and at the end of it all, my little daughter came out. It <laughs> was great. But I'm good at saying, this is a book, and we're going to look at this, and, yeah. you know, come to this museum. And yeah. I'm kind of fairly good like that, I think. Yes. Well, what about, how much now is left of the lad from Brixton, do you think? Not very much, I think. I mean, no. you know. What moves on? <sighs> I mean, I never got, I, I never became who I should have been until maybe 12, 15 years ago. Uh, it's been an awful lot of my life, as uh, I think most people in so-called entertainment industry are actually looking for myself, you know, and understanding what it was that I... I, I it, uh, why, what I existed for, what was it that really made me happy in life, and who exactly I was, and, and uh, who are the parts of myself I was trying to hide from a lot. You know, it's, it's like exposing yourself. And uh, I think a lot of us are, uh, one, dysfunctional in show business. It's show business. Uh, pretty dysfunctional, and two, um, in huge senses of denial about who we are and where we exist in the world. There's some kind of traumatism often goes on in our childhoods, I think, that uh, makes us crave some kind of strange affection, you know? And sort of, and often you'll find that the, the person who craves a lot of affection actually isn't terribly good at giving it. And uh, I found that all my life, especially in the 70s, I was yeah. like that. I really wanted to sort of, you know, be very emotionally involved with people. I didn't know how to do it. You know, my parents were like that. Yeah. And uh, I guess you kind of, as I say, Larkin's right in that way. You know, they, they, they pass on a lot of faults. Yeah. Did you buy that, Tom? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's very true. You're, it's, you're, we're in a narcissistic, or narcissistic business. We're constantly figuring, how do I do that? What do I have to do next? Let's talk about me. Enough about me. What do you think of these <laughs> shoes? Are these good shoes? <laughs> that I should wear? Right. It's like that. What about, um, and the other t thing too, is, uh, the kind of problems that your children have in dealing with this kind of narcissistic approach, if you like, because the animal is that, whichever way you look at it, they can observe this kind of, the effect that fame has on you, and the way that other people, that people react differently to you than they do to other people. That's something you can't really tell them about, isn't it? I mean, they have to sort of make their own mind up about that. Is it as, as casual as that, or other things you can do? I think, well, in, in, in uh, my situation, I think my son watched me grow up you know, which is kind of, it was very strange for him in some ways, and uh, uh, sometimes I feel there's almost a, a protective quality about him when he's with me, you know, which is kind of... He's nice. looking after you? Yeah, well, he's not, but he is, you know but what I mean? I said it, like, I yeah, don't know. It's, yeah. uh, but I, uh, I also feel the same way. I, I really want to protect him too. Let's hear a classic song of yours, Life on Mars, but first of all, before we hear that, uh, tell me how you came to write this song. Uh, well, when I, was, uh, when I was just a little sprog, uh, Will you I, do it in a Yorkshire accent, all of it? No, 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 no. I, oh, I can't do any accent. Um, <laughs> it, I was with a, a music publishing company, uh, and they were passing me songs, lots of them from the, uh, I was going to say from the Orient. Some of them sounded like they came from the Orient. A lot of songs from Europe. Um, 
that they wanted me to do kind of English translation, to not translation, but a new set of English lyrics for, you know. Um, one of them was this French song that I thought was really very good, and I wrote some really terrible lyric. I think it was called Even a Fool Learns to Love. Um, and I send it back again. I thought, oh, that's the last day of that. Then I hear it on the radio. I thought, that's that chill, that must be my song. I thought, no, these are different lyrics. And it was Sinatra singing my way. And I was, <laughs> well, I wrote the lyrics, what happened? I phoned them up and said, oh yeah, your lyrics were rubbish. And I said, I know that, but they the ones I did. And they said, yeah, well, we got Paul Anker to do them instead, and, and this is my way. And I, that really made me angry for so long, about a year. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, eventually I wrote my, I thought, well, I can do I can write something as big as that, and I'll, I'll write one that sounds a bit like it. And so I did Life on Mars, which is my sort of, you know, revenge trip on uh, my way. Well, thank God you did. <laughs> <laughs> so after this, what? You're on tour at present? And you're I'm going home. Signal. I'm, see, I'm missing my wife and uh, baby like crazy. And, uh, right. you know, have a good long uh, writing thing <laughs> afterwards. And, uh, <laughs> 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 whoops, I didn't want to go there. And then, uh, and then Christmas comes and we'll be, you know, sort of going through all that and... I think my daughter's ready to really take the tree in now, you know, two and a half. It'll make sense, won't it? Well, well thank you for talking to me tonight. I've really much enjoyed it and I uh, hope to It's been a great again pleasure again meeting you both. It's been lovely. David Boy. Why did you change so often? I mean, what was the need for it? Was it just a gimmick? Or was it just something that the you wanted to sort of get to out sort of, of um, uh, But I, when I started writing songs, nobody would record them, so I had to do them myself. And I didn't, being a Capricorn, I didn't want to expose myself to the public, so I developed a series of characters which fell in line with the material that I was writing. So behind that all the time was a real David Bowie? At times, yes, I lost control a couple of mm. times. But. So did the roles that you played on stage then kind of take you over sometimes yes. in private life? Yes. What about all those incredible, that, that period when you wore those outrageous feminine clothes and the makeup? Feminine? Madam. Well, they were. They were they, I mean, a lot of people, I mean, I thought David Bowie, and I immediately associate you with that. Yeah. That particular period. I mean, did you, did that carry over into real life? Did you wear those kind of clothes in your home? I only used to wear that kind of stuff when I was about 17 or 18. Um, by the time I'd reached the ripe old age of 20, 21, mm. I'd um, got into um, high heel shoes and things. Um, they came about through Japanese theatre more than anything else. I tried to put together kabuki and um, pantomime. Oh, over here, of course, it's mime, isn't it? Mm. Um, mime techniques to help enhance this character called Ziggy Stardust, who is the be-all and end-all of rock and roll stars. So a lot of people looking at some of those roles that you played, I think would have been very shocked and found them very outrageous. Yeah. And also there's this tremendous tendency to think of, of rock stars as, or pop stars generally, as, as being a bit thick. I yeah. mean, obviously there's, I presume, a lot more to you than that. Did it worry you that people had that kind of image? No, I'm very thick. <laughs> Are you? I yes, you. I became a rock star. <laughs> I could have been a painter. But does it need, what, to just get something out of your system? No, no, no. I wanted to be some kind of artist. Um, I wanted to prove myself in some field as an artist, and I didn't think I was a very good painter, so I went to music. You've had tremendous publicity um, over the years of your, your marriage to Angie, and you've admitted that you're bisexual. Mm. Was that, in a way, publicity that you sought that helped your career, or did you actually think of that as a tremendous Which? intrusion of your... Well, the publicity you had about your relationship? Um, no, that evolved, I think, because of the fact that I'd said many years ago that I was a bisexual. But that happened in the course of a conversation. Mm. But do you resent that kind of publicity? Do you think that's an intrusion on your privacy? No, it's not an intrusion on my privacy. I Doesn't decline worry. to read it. Mm. You <laughs> it's play like television, you can switch yeah. it off if it's not interesting. You see, now you're looking exactly like the character that you play in the film that you've just done. So I wondered whether slightly you were actually now playing another role almost. In another year or two, we're going to see yet another. Uh, I had this shirt a, a few months before the film. Mm. <laughs> So you're not, this is, this is really you, this is not you just still sort of playing the role of Paul in the film. Mum wonders. I was um, working with Nicholas Rogan, the man who fell to earth a couple of years ago, and he warned me that um, 
when one's finished a film, the role often carries over for many months after the film, and then I should be prepared for that. I think that happened to me when I was um, performing the characters that I was performing in America and England, but I didn't have a director to tell me that they would carry over, so they all built up and became a mass sort of conglomerate character. Why did you want to make this particular film, Just a Jiggler? Um, Marlene Dietrich was dangled in front of me for one thing. Also, I got on extremely well with David Hemmings. Um, and so between those two things, mm. I think I was pulled into it. What was it like working with Marlene Dietrich? I wish I knew. I must ask somebody who did work with her. Why? <laughs> well, it, what happened, for the duration of the film, they were trying to get Marlene to come to Germany, but she wouldn't because since, uh, I think, a period in the 50s, she's been reluctant to go back because um, her views differed very much with what was happening in Germany during the war. So she stayed in Paris and said, I will do my filming in Paris. All the way through the film she said this. And uh, I quite agreed with her. And we talked to each other on the phone and we decided it would be fine if I did my bit in Berlin and she did her bit in Paris and the two were gelled together. And you never actually of, met her? No. That's but amazing. I, I think it's quite nice in the context of the film because she's forever the observer, really. And uh, knowing that, it makes her mm. even more of the observer. The well, mystical, wonderful, mm. Cocteau character that she is. Do you lack anything, David Burr? Isn't she lovely? She's marvellous. I wish I'd met her. Looks fantastic. A long time ago. Mm. <laughs> I'm picking up the line she addressed you in the film. Do you, do you feel you lack anything, or have you got everything you want now? Yes, a train ticket to Penge. I've got some friends out there, and I promised I'd go and see them this week, but I haven't had the time to get down there yet. Are you going to give up music now and, and concentrate on acting? Is this a new whole direction? I'd like to expand my activities, as they say. Um, no, I, I enjoy writing very much. Um, but writing, just music or writing, all sorts of writing? Um, funnily enough, I am sort of studiously trying to write a book of short stories based on things that I've done. Um, but writing music generally. Um, performance on stage, I think I've decided really to cut it down for once every two years because I find it boring after the first ten shows it starts to become mm. repetitious every night the same thing. So will there be more acting and more films? Yes there will. I'm heading towards directing. As Are you? Yeah, very much. That, that's a, a final hope is it? No, I want to be a good painter again. It's my really mm. big dream. I think. And I, are you painting at the moment? Yes, all the time. Mm -hmm. And writing and acting and still singing? Yes. Lots of things. Is there another film I have a not? selection in front of me which I'm very proud of and I'm, I'm going through them deciding which one I'm going to do. Mm. That's exciting. Mm. Well, we look forward to seeing them. David Bowie, thank you very much for talking to me. Thank you very much. Uh, what we're going to do is we have three handheld mics going around here, one of which I'll be holding. There's uh, two other people. Where, where are the others? There's Nicole. Where is the third one? There's Jacqueline. So just raise your hand, and one of us will be coming towards you uh, to hand you the mic. Okay, I've got one. Very good. Hang on. <laughs> just a second. I'd like to get my dry cleaning back, <laughs> actually. If anybody knows anything about it? Good afternoon. Hello. This is Anders from Sweden. Hi, Anders. Uh, I'd like to ask you, do you get nervous before these kind of things? No, good lord. <laughs> uh, did you ever? Um, I, don't, I can't remember, actually. I don't think I've done many of them. About four, I think. This is about my <laughs> fourth, fourth, fourth time. Do you put on an act in any way when you do this? Absolutely, yes. This <laughs> is, <laughs> okay. As you can see, this is uh, very choreographed. I've got one here. Uh, hi. Uh, you said it in an interview in The Standard last week, yeah. you talked about the tyranny of the mainstream yeah. and how an album like Outside was designed to avoid that. Yeah. Do you think you'd still be able Successfully, to... I'd suggest. Indeed. Yeah. Do you think you'd still be able to say that had you never had mainstream success? <coughs> Do you think you'd still talk about touring in the mainstream? I think so, yeah, because that was my chief interest before um, I had that, that sort of success. It's really the only thing that... It was anything that I bought or used to go and see, really, or listen to, it was always stuff on the edge. 
I was always far more interested in the periphery of uh, life's matters than sort of what was happening in the center. The center sort of seemed a simple vocabulary or something. Well, it didn't catch my imagination anyway. Don't you really get the real art coming in from the edges? No, I think you get it from both. I think I, 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 I'm, a, I'm a, uh, think I'm as much influenced by real popular art as I am with obscure, kind of rather diffident stuff. But I'm just, you're kind of a, a creature of eclecticism, aren't I, really? Wouldn't you say? <laughs> I'm a bit of a hybrid. Got one here? Hi. Hello. Um, I read in an interview a uh, reference to, um, to a quote from Picasso that it, it took him 30 years to, to learn to paint like a, ba like a child. Yeah. Um, are you still striving for that kind of simplicity, or are you... You, you no, I don't there. think so. I, I think I like, um, you know, he said another interesting thing. Somebody said to him, but what you do, a child of three could do that. And he said, yes, but very few adults, which I thought was a nice comment. Um, but I think I like, um, I like complications. I like things that seem to be endless uh, puzzles and... I've always liked art with, that was fairly enigmatic, you know, and, and maybe was made of layers and things. So I like, I like, uh, I like thickly textured things. But Brian Eno is probably more like, he, he goes for a much simpler, more minimalist thing. Well, he's a minimalist, isn't he? I mean, he only wears black corduroy, so... Sign of a minimalist. Have one here. Uh, hi, David. Hello. Uh, in America, I think he created some sort of a cyber operatic, cinematic type of show, and you interact a lot with Trent Reznor. Uh, no, sorry, what do you mean? What, the show that I've just done in America? Yeah. Not, no, not at all. It was mm. very untheatrical, actually. All we used, we used lighting. Um, but on the whole, it was uh, very much just singing the songs. They were just autonomous pieces. They, they, they weren't connected in any way. And I threw in quite a lot of, uh, of my older, maybe less known songs. Well, they're known to people who have bought my albums. Now, don't take it away from him. He hasn't really got his question out yet. I'm just in time being... <laughs> I'm being interrupted. Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> Carry on. Uh, um, you interact a lot with Nine Inch Nails and yeah, Trent Reznor. Yeah, um, yeah. Is Morrissey as attractive and as entertaining as Trent? It's difficult, you know. I've had not hard, hardly had any, any contact with Morrissey. Uh, I guess we'll get to say hello tomorrow <laughs> night. <laughs> I've not seen the guy. I mean, he seems... I thought I was reclusive. <laughs> this guy, <laughs> this guy's impossible to get a hold of. I mean, <laughs> he never answers me phone calls. <laughs> I think, no, I didn't say anything nasty about him. Let's be clear. No, I think he's wonderful. I think he's one of Britain's best lyricists. I think he's, uh, he sort of rocks Alan Bennett, I think. Um, I think he's probably uh, a very perceptive about a certain British kind of the quirkiness of the Brits. I think there's something very fifties about him. He's kind of a John Osborne figure. Um, I think it's going to be very enjoyable. I, th I, I think it really sh could be quite a lot of fun. But Trent and I, you know, I mean, we sort of rehearsed quite a long time before we went out, um, and there's there's a continuum there because we're going to be doing some work. Um, from this point over the next two or three months, we're going to be sort of doing some recording <coughs> things together, uh, which is more about sending each other tapes and changing them and then sending them back. So it's a bit like a parcel game. Um, I enjoyed working with him very much. He's a good kid, yeah. Hi, uh, Pierre Pirano, Hello. French journalist. Hello. Um, your track, uh, Ask Filthy Lesson, is in the movie Seven. Yeah. Have you seen the finished movie, and did you offer them the rest of the album to make the soundtrack? No, I s um, the uh, director, David Fincher, asked uh, the record label if he could use the track in the film. I only saw the film the week before last. Did you think, oh God, I should have used the whole album? It's about the similar topic. No, I was quite <laughs> glad that they only used the one track that they used. <laughs> I agree with you there. Uh, I, believe I you thought Morgan Freeman was absolutely excellent, by the way. 
uh, when you were in the studio, you were uh, working with a computer for for the uh, for creating with the lyrics. Yeah. So you, do you were looking for uh, uh, creating a lucky order with the computer or uh, deliberate chaos? You know, I think the process sounds a lot more random than what the uh, resultant is. Uh, I was thinking a lot about that about a few weeks ago when it was uh, somebody put asked me a very similar question that was it just total randomness that I was after um, I actually find some kind of coherent there's a co uh, there's a kind of continuum in a song say I don't know how well you know the songs on the album but something like uh, the voyeur of utter destruction which is almost I would say 70% processed by the computer um, but it's my choice uh, how lines are juxtaposed against each other. And I think in the same way, uh, immodestly, that a, a Joyce or a Burroughs would use jumbled sentences against each other. There's a, there's a thread that runs through any chunk of, of a song that has some kind of sense to it. Uh, so it might have come out, come out of circumstances that were random, um, but there's um, maybe not a logic, but there's a rationale there somewhere. Uh -huh, but you're 100% happy? With yeah, I like working this way very much. Uh, but I always did. I always liked working this way. I mean, I wasn't working this way. So I'm not actually a very good writer, but my choices are very good. That's my strength. And I get there's a certain, I can, I can intuitively feel when there's an interesting poignancy or extremism or a point is made. I can, I can generally detect that. Oh, thank you very much. Right up here. Yeah. Hi, I'm Kiki from Germany. Over here. Hello. <laughs> um, I just uh, wanted to know, on uh, the album on the sleeve, you used a lot of uh, diary fragments. Yeah. Um, do you keep a diary for yourself in a way where, where you modeled uh, things like that? I, you know, I actually have done since I wrote that story. I've never kept one before, but I've been keeping one this last year. Um. So there are no uh, bits left from that uh, 1977 uh, period where... I wish I'd kept a diary during that period. <laughs> Boy, do I ever. And my life looks so bland reading through these last 12 months. <laughs> I had all those high points there. Uh, no longer obvious. Hi, David. Yes. How's your wife doing? She's doing very well. <laughs> <laughs> I promoted your gig in Bangkok in night. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Remember? Yeah, I do very well. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Do you fancy any collaboration with uh, Domingo or Pavarotti like Bono did? No. <laughs> <laughs> It's not on my list of priorities, let's put it that way, no. Thank you. One at the back here. Um, Hello. Uh, the plot of the record seems to uh, reflect the fact that with um, self-mutilation and self-expression coming uh, intermingled, has modern art, uh, is that about to reach uh, some kind of final frontier? No, I think, I think it's uh, merely I think I, I would imagine that what's going on in not only the visual arts but I think in popular culture is almost a purging before the end of this millennium. I'd imagine at the very start of the next millennium things will be delightfully and tinkly lovely. Uh, I think it's all symbolic. I don't think it, it, it bodes some great negative future at all. In fact, I'm very positive about the future. I think a lot of it is to do with the ritual of uh, looking for a spiritual foundation, which I think is the shakiest part about living in the end of the 20th century. Spiritual, not religious, I might add. A spiritual foundation. Hello again. Hello. Um, Hello again. You, um, you've created this character for the Inside and the Outside albums. Yeah. Um, but how, um, in terms of identification, how was it different from, uh, like, putting yourself in that part as opposed to doing it in a film? Because you said you're not too keen on, on film roles, really. No, I don't like acting. Um, why much. did you create a particular character for this thing then? 
I, it's, I find it very easy now to be, play the part of, um, pun intended, of, a, of, an, of an author. I feel quite comfortable in that situation. Um, I find it not a problem to distance myself from the things that I write about. Whereas I think uh, 20, 25 years ago, I would have felt a lot more involved in the characters that I was writing because at that time I wasn't really sure of how you defined the uh, parameters of what one was writing. I didn't know how much of myself was supposed to be in there or... I was a real learner and it got... I, I found it... maybe I was very naive but I found it very confusing. Um, now I just like... I like writing as a fictional author. I enjoy that. I'd like to write more prose, in fact, and, I don't know, get a Booker Prize. <laughs> Somebody else's, I don't care, you know, it doesn't have to be mine. Hello, David. Hi, hello. I'm from hello. Again, and I'd like to know, when you went to cooking, what you experienced uh, there were and how you put them to use when recording the album? Cooking was an incre incredible... Um, experience for those of you that maybe don't know it it's um, a mental hospital institution on the outskirts of uh, Vienna in Austria and a mutual friend of Brian Eno's and myself Andre Heller who's an artist and uh, something of an entrepreneur suggested we might like to do some work there or with the inmates or somehow he wanted us to go and see Gugging and see what's going on um, uh, what it is, it's a hospital where 100% of the inmates are involved in the visual arts. Um, it was, I believe, um, an experiment that was set up in mid-60s? You don't know. I think it's something like the mid-60s, yeah. Um, there's so many inmates in, in hospitals in and around Austria showed uh, a proclivity for the visual arts that they thought it might be a good idea to give them their own wing where they could sort of examine and and create things and uh, this is the this is really the foundation of what's subsequently beco become called outsider art and we went to talk with the uh, patients there and, and look at what they were doing um, and I found it well it reminded me a lot of course of uh, a museum in uh, Switzerland called uh, La Brute, which is in Lausanne, that was started by Dubuffet, with similar sorts of uh, ideas, I think. Um, and I just like the sense of uh, exploration and the lack of self-judgment about what the artists were doing. And it became one of the atmospheres for the album. I, think. I enjoyed it very much. David, I'm Morten from Denmark. Could you tell Hi. me a bit about your fascination of the year, of the year 2000? <coughs> it's not really a fascination with the year 2000. It's much more uh, a curiosity about why things are like they are now. I mean, the album may bring into play the idea of the barrier of the year 2000, but really it's about 1995. Um, one of the things that Brian and I hope to do is to complete this cycle of albums, four or five of them, as a sort of a musical or textual diary for the last five years of the 90s. The subject matter isn't really... Uh, the subject matter may bring into play the year 2000, but the content is the texture of this year. Um, David? Yes. I'm from Austria too, so... Uh, oh, hi. My question is... Uh, is it true that you wanted to work with Andre Heller on the circus? Yeah, we had an idea. <coughs> what Brian and I wanted to do was to uh, create some kind of situation um, that never really happened, but film it as though it had, it had happened. We were going to document an event which never took place um, surrounding the album, but. The ideas that Andre, myself and Brian had for it got so out of hand and it all started to look like a, a major money thing. I mean, people were talking in terms of millions of dollars and suddenly we were told that if we were going to do it for this amount of money then it had to look a particular way for television and all these things came into it. And we, Brian and I just wanted to do something for a few thousand, you know, 
so that at least we can have artistic control. But it was, it just grew, it, it became, it just became something like a big TV production thing. And so we dropped the idea rather than get involved in that nonsense. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Hello, hello again. Uh, do you know uh, so far how will, uh, how will the diaries end or if they will uh, end definitely sometime? Um, yeah, I think, uh, I think they will end in the year 2000. I mean, there's quite likely because of the way Brian and I work that w the narrative might really fall by the wayside on the next album. We don't, we're not actually sure whether the narrative will even continue or it might suddenly re-emerge on album four or something we don't know because we don't know what the next year is going to feel like it really the, the sound and what happens to the albums will be di dictated by the year before uh -huh. yeah. and another question uh, have you ever been feel uh, tempted uh, to experiment the, this kind of art uh, which is murder um, <laughs> number of times but it was never connected with art <laughs> Remember any? I felt murderous on a few occasions, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Bowie. Yeah. Um, we heard, just heard that you were going on a European tour. Uh, yes. Starting. How, what is it that makes you continue to go on touring? I mean, you. Um, the ex I think the excitement of uh, new, uh, new material. Um, is really the the thing that will just get me out of the house. Um, I think that's the only reason that I would tour. I don't think I could just tour and tour. And I'm not actually that, that keen on doing performances, you know, because I get, um, I don't know, after a week, I don't really see the point of doing them again. Uh, but logistically, that's not really possible. So at least I don't tour, <laughs> well, maybe once every four or five years. So does that mean that the people who want to see you should go to the first appearances then in Finland and Sweden? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm quite a trooper. I mean, I'll never let the side down, but <laughs> I know what you mean. I think they should all come tomorrow night. <laughs> <laughs> then we can all get it over with. <laughs> uh, hi again, David. It's over here, over here. Yeah. Do you keep any Andy's memorabilia? What do you feel like play Andy Warhol in the movie? Do 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 I what? Did you keep any Andy's memorabilia? I mean, shoes, clothes. Oh no no no! The museum were insistent they wanted it all back again. <laughs> I could have used the wig. I would have, I would have, liked, I would have liked a wig. He had hundreds of them, hundreds of them, and they're all made by this guy on Broadway. I mean, some dodgy wig maker's place. <laughs> near the red light district on Brawl by him, and they weren't sort of posh wigs or anything. But he had, I don't know, two, three hundred wigs. But uh, somebody told me, knew him quite well, that he would actually phone somebody every couple of weeks and ask them if they'd come over and cut his hair. And they had to, and it was like not talked about that it was a wig, that he'd just sit there and they'd, they'd just take a little bit more off the back, please. And I was like it was growing. <laughs> what, one last question. I really want to believe that, because I think what, that's such a mysterious thing. <laughs> Do you see any of the cinematic ideas of outside crossing over into a real script, or being, have you been asked to launch <coughs> at Morton's and discuss these ideas I think, with the I think it's, people? Uh, Thank I, th you. I think the one thing about the album is that it, 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 it feels quite pertinent. It's fairly synchronistic, I think, that in popular culture so many serial killer films have been released uh, over this last couple of months there's one in particular called copycat which i don't know if it's released over here where the uh, detective progenitor in it at one point says my god he wants us to believe his murders are art which i'm sure has nothing to do with my album but the fact is that people are thinking in those terms there was um recently an artist about a month ago showing in Philadelphia when we arrived in Philadelphia on the tour called Charles Scarborough who had an exhibit called um, Serial Killers and it was just body bags and uh, um, the remains of bodies and uh, scalpels and all the implements associated with serial killing. 
I just read the review. I, did, I didn't want to go and see it particularly. <laughs> I'm not actually that interested in it, you know. <laughs> it just it felt that it kind of represented the savagery of people's spiritual life at the moment, sort of plunging it into these arcane areas. I am a camera. Ha ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Patrick from France. Uh, hi. Uh, I read that you said that you didn't want uh, to work on melodies on this album. Why uh, are melodies uh, contradictory uh, with the universe oh, no. you wanted to make? Yeah, my um, chief problem with that is that I naturally fall into them. I mean, I can't help but make melodies. That's what's good. I, f I mean, I fight that all the time, and Brian fights it even more. Um, I'm just good at them. I mean, I'm good at writing tunes. So, being the kind of obtuse fellow that I am, I, I try very hard to go away from that. Otherwise, I'd just be churning them out. It would be so simple for me to churn out album after album of good tunes where you walk out of the building singing the set <laughs> um, I don't have a problem with that so you're not after the ultimate pop song anymore no I'm much more interested in doing something with music than creating songs uh, songs really don't interest me that much they're kind of singular they're just things I mean I just I'm much more interested in in kind of sitting back and saying, yeah, I changed the texture of music in this way or that way. I made music do a different thing. It's like really kind of vain ideas of changing the course of rivers. I don't want to build canoes. Hello. Hi. Um, I had uh, the impression that on the album you relied a lot on uh, improvisation. Yes, um, very much so, in the music, yeah. And um, how much is this important when you go on stage? How much uh, is yeah, this element still? Yeah, uh, interesting point. Um, I think probably within the context of several of the songs, there's a certain amount of improvisation. Um, but it's amazing how formulaic it's all become. Um, it's down to, I think, it's a real challenge that, you know. You're quite right, that's a very interesting point. How far could one go on stage? I guess if I wanted to lose the audience entirely, which uh, <laughs> seems I'm doing the best that I can at the moment, but I, the, the idea of making each and every show totally improvisational is... <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I couldn't have put it better myself. <laughs> uh, it's terribly enticing, you know. <laughs> okay. Hello, David. I'm Thanos from Greece. Hello. Uh, is there any... Yeah, PJ Harvey played there the other night. Did you go to the show? No, I I'm based in England, actually. Oh. She liked Athen Athens a lot. Do you think you might play there? Uh, um, I think a lot of countries that aren't actually in the list at the moment, I know of three or four that are actually under discussion at the moment, so it's uh, very likely. I mean, whilst I've got this, I've got what, together what I would consider a dream band. Um, they're just the best musicians that I've ever worked with all the way around. And I'd like to try and keep the band together as long as possible, because as soon as we stop, They've all got such independent careers in their own right that I'm going to lose everybody, so I'm just going to endlessly go on and on and on and on. Uh, David, two questions. First one, how was it to work with Mike Garson again? And second what? one, yeah. uh, is there any musical style, a group or artist that came out in the 80s and 90s that you consider interesting or worth Oh, sure? yeah, lots. Gee. Uh, well, firstly, with Garson, I actually started working with him again, you know, on an album called The Buddha of Suburbia, which is, um, it started out as a soundtrack to a, a BBC play a couple of years ago, and Mike did some work with me on that, and it was just uh, astonishing that he still had the zest for playing around at the edge of the pool again. I mean, he's, he's still as uh, eccentric and as quirky as ever in his playing. He doesn't seem to have... Uh, 
Well, he's been playing with some interesting people. In, in the 80s, for me, I thought the best band in the 80s were the Pixies. And I thought it was uh, a, just a disaster that Frank broke them up at the wrong time. Really, I think they could have been a, a terribly important band now if they'd stayed together. That's a shame. And uh, again, like so many of those band situations, Frank just isn't... He doesn't have the strength without the rest. The chemistry of the band was so strong that it's just a shame that he kind of opted to go solo. But there again, I don't know what all the personal problems, because I know there were personal problems in the band, so I don't really know. I think uh, PJ, not just because I've just worked with him, but I think PJ Harvey's great. Um, I also think Trick is wonderful out of Britain, anyway. Um, uh, but Scott Walker album this year that came out that nobody bought, use as usual. Did somebody buy it here? Yeah. Well done. <laughs> Give that woman a cake. <laughs> That's uh, for me one of the uh, uh, more serious, uh, uh, adventurous pieces of work that I've heard in years. I think it's tremendous. Absolutely, absolutely great. Funny though, I didn't hear it on the radio. <laughs> yeah, I think again that Morrissey doesn't doesn't write in a formulaic way. I think that he expresses himself very much from very much from a place where he wants to come from. It strikes me that he doesn't write to match audiences' expectations of him, which for me is the most important. I think when I'm looking and listening to other people and their work. I always get a sense of, yeah, he's trying to please me, you know, and if they're trying to please me, I tend to go off them really fast. Hi, um, me again. In the context of uh, the sort of spiritual renewal that you're looking for, how do you feel well, about Well, I found it. <laughs> <laughs> well, on behalf of everybody else, are you, are you looking forward to playing Belfast next week? Yeah, very much so. When was the last time you were there? It's got to have been in the 70s. I played Dublin, which of course is a, another different. thing altogether, but uh, I've not played Belfast for many years. H have you been there? Have you visited? Have you got friends no, there? No, I haven't. Like yes, I've got friends that come from Belfast, but I've not been there. So it's very, of course, that's uh, for me, is very exciting. David? Yeah? Uh, I know that you've uh, visited South Africa a few times. Yeah, uh, once, only once. Once, at Cape Town. Yeah, um, um, and uh, Johannesburg. Right. I know there's a lot of Yes. Um, do, you, do you think that, that might creep into your music? And would you like to play in the New South Africa? In <coughs> I'd like very much to play in the New South Africa. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd absolutely jump at that chance if it were offered. I hope it does um, get tabled, because I'd really like to do that. Um, um, Friends of mine have been concerned with sort of trying to re-involve, and I say re-involve because African music has been probably one of the uh, bedrocks of all modern popular music, actually. But uh, people like uh, David Byrne and the Talking Heads and, and uh, Eno himself in the late 80s were working along those lines. Um, I think I waited until it became American music and then my, my, my way of working is sort of working with very strong American rhythmic qualities and, and having this kind of Eurocentric ambience on the top. In a, in, a, in a nutshell, that's sort of how I work. More, more heartbeats and spirits instead of uh, yeah. sound. Yes, I think probably you're right. I don't know, you tell me. <laughs> I'm the worst person to analyse my own music. Hello again. <laughs> I've known by the way. <laughs> um, um, about, the, um, about your art, um, your involvement in art, um, yeah. I don't know how familiar you are with the self-storage project that... Um, yeah, um, they're branded, yeah. Yeah. Um, have, you, um, have you considered doing something on that sort of, um, of that sort, like installation work? Yeah, I've been asked to do two next year, when I get off this tour, uh, to do two next year, which uh, uh, I'd really like to have a crack at. Really, well, the the, the I think this this uh, the rather the strangest one is one that da uh, Damien Hurst and I put the ideas together um, for um, last year, where one of Damien's fans has left him his body in his will. Um, 
but I think we'd have to wait quite a long time because he seems to be relatively healthy and quite young. <laughs> but he wanted to be included in one of uh, Damien's pieces when he uh, shuffled off this mortal coil. Um, and we were trying to sort of work out ideas in which we could use it. And we, we came up with a couple of ideas that were, were just, that these might be long-term projects. <laughs> That's interesting, I don't know. I don't know. I'll have to think about that. I presumed it would be by myself, but I don't think it might be with somebody else. If you've got any suggestions, you can let me know. I'll think about it. Okay. Uh, you've used the song Strangers When We Meet. Yes. Uh, twice. Is that because of the different contexts? No, it's much simpler than that. I thought it was a bloody good song, and I think it got lost on the first time round, so I thought, well, let's ram it down people's throats a second time. Someone said that uh, after listening to Outside, that's just what I need to uh, stop my stomach from turning. Well, the strangers at the end. Yeah. I'm very delicate of them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Why don't they say what they really mean? <laughs> so, David, for the, once again, so for the first part of Outside, you started jamming with the musicians in the studio, um, giving everyone a different subject and having them play uh, to the different subject. Didn't you want them to harmonize, or what was the reason? The fir actually, the very first thing that we asked them to do was redecorate the studio. Um, and we got, I mean, we got them painting and uh, putting up wallpaper and carpets and just generally redecorating. And having gotten to that point, it was quite hard to get them to actually start playing instruments again. <laughs> so everybody's... Inside every musician, there's an interior decorator waiting to get out. <laughs> I found. <laughs> we, we created any device that came to hand to stop them being like regular. The worst thing is to go into a studio and think that you've got to make this album, you know, and, and that colours everything. It's trying to break out of that, those dreadful constraints of, of this earnest, industrial, this is what the record industry expects kind of thinking. So we, we will we'll try almost anything to get people to forget that they're making an album. I, I, what we, the, really, what... The ultimate situation is to have some kind of event happen and the thing is recorded. That's really the ultimate situation. It's very hard to get those circumstances like that, but you can get quite near. Rather than there's the recording studio and then you have to deliver something that works for the studio. And are you okay, sorry, to sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to let you know five more minutes, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. Are you planning to do something like that on the next part of outside is there going to be yes part? yes uh, brian and i have sort of at least worked out different kinds of parameters different ideas we were thinking in terms of maybe just describing a night in uh, new oxford town or something we don't we don't know we, we just we really won't know until we go back in the studio again david when uh, you were doing the album at mountain studios uh, <laughs> hello Molly. Hello, how are you? Um, <laughs> nice hat <laughs> thank you very much Nice wig you've got there. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> um, this is not yeah, Andy's. Cut through, I noticed. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, back uh, to Mountain No, the, this is real stuff. I know that. Yeah. I know that. <laughs> the dandruff is fake. <laughs> <laughs> Mountain Studios, when you went in and um, with Sterling and the rest of the boys, as Nathan Adler's diaries unfolded, did it shock you? Did it surprise you? It actually did, yeah. 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 Because it's, um, when you're improvising, I think you tap into all kinds of uh, unconscious ideas and thoughts. And I think, I think always some of the stuff that you sort of, you, you, you sort of bring out are the stuff of nightmares mm. or dreams, you know. So it's quite surprising. And just, j just when you vocally had to do it, I mean, there's so many uh, different moods, uh, different deep feelings, different light feelings, I mean, when you did the vocals, how did you approach them? I mean, because you, you, your gymnastics go from one to another. Yeah. The um, original thing that I did, uh, we did, we did a, uh, a set of three and a half hours of improvisation on, I think it was March the 20th, 94, that we're going to put out at some point, um, which was really the, the genesis for this whole thing. 
And that was absolutely and complete improvisation for three and a half hours. And there's an awful lot of just straightforward dialogue improv on it. And uh, some of the stuff that comes out of that is really peculiar, really strange. It was a little, the, the album, the resultant album outside is a bit more ordered than our original thing. David? Yeah. Uh, how important is uh, painting for you? And have you ever thought of giving up music and just do painting? No, I, I, I can't. I really, I just can't see a time when I would uh, start making music. I enjoy it far too much. It really is a lifeblood for me. It's uh, a source of uh, nourishment in a way. And I try and say that with a smile. <laughs> it really is. I enjoy it so much. Um, but uh, but likewise, I do in enjoy. I enjoy writing. I enjoy painting. I enjoy any way of of, of trying to uh, ascertain my position in in a universe, and it has to do with those things, creative outlets, I, I guess. Do you see it as work or or uh, no. hobbies or? Uh... No, just. Um, it's as real as breathing. It's as much part of me as that. Okay, one more from over here and then... Yeah, hi. I'm Lynn from Norway. Hello. I don't think you see me. Uh, oh, I do now. <laughs> um, now for a, a recent interview with one of the journalists in my paper, you said something about you want to do some kind of theatre or musicals and stuff out of the album. Have you thought more about that or are you going to musicals later or something? Um, yeah, not so much a musical, but uh, maybe a piece of uh, a piece of theatre that involves the albums. I'd like very much to work with an American director called Robert Wilson, um, who for me is probably the the most important director of the last ten years in America, or even longer, into the seventies actually. He did a piece that you might know called Einstein on the Beach with Philip Glass a number of years ago, um, and I just thought that uh, possibly. Um, a collaboration between Robert, Brian and myself might prove really interesting. So we kind of like to do that. I'm not so sure th if that would fall into the category of what one thinks of as a musical. It would be theatre with music, something like that.